Welcome to the ins and outs of probate for genealogists. Where there is a will, there's a way. Um, this is the second in a series of nine uh, videos that are being posted on the BYU Family History Library YouTube channel. You might wish to review the first one of this series for some background in this particular subject. One of the most common issues in using probate law is that it is very challenging. For example, if you were starting law school right now, the current popular text for Wills, Trusts, and Estates is a book by Duke Miner and Sitkoff, and this book costs over $200 and has over a thousand pages. If I recall correctly, my own text for uh, Trusts and Estates had close to a thousand pages. Um, that's really just the beginning, sort of an introductory book on the subject. It, in addition, probate records are little known and little used by genealogists. Uh, many records uh, are characterized by presenters as being both little known or little used, but in this case, it is correct because probate records, because of their complexity, are not usually uh, consulted. Another factor, of course, is their availability. They sometimes are di very difficult to find, although they are becoming more pop, more uh, commonly available. Today, some of the larger websites, such as Ancestry.com and FamilySearch.org, have large numbers of probate files uh, digitized, and some of them are even indexed. Probate records are important for the reason that they are essential for research in the area, in the time period predating birth and death records kept by civil authorities. Uh, most, in the United States, most civil birth and death records um, only began being registered back in the late 1800s or early 1900s. Uh, so any records before that time about the death and the families of, of the ancestors must come from some other source, usually church records. The church records are rather limited compared to the amount of information that can be available in a probate record. It's also, it's also important to understand that probate laws differed from, differ from state to state. The first step is to identify the place where the probate records are archived. This can take some considerable detective work on the part of a genealogical researcher. The reason is that the, the older the records are, the more likely it is that they have been moved from the original court to some other location. If they are not digitized, they may still be in paper form sitting in the basement or, or, or attic of a courthouse building. It's important to check the local laws before doing any research. The laws change not only from place to place, but from time to time. And understanding the law surrounding a probate action makes understanding what happened in the probate action a lot simpler. The first step, of course, would be to search online for the records. It's important to understand that the people who want to preserve and use probate records are not necessarily genealogists. They are attorneys, the people researching land and property cases and other, and other actions. So these records are sometimes available directly from the courts, uh, either free or for a charge, and may be completely online back many, many years. It is also a good idea to contact the court for availability. The, the clerk of the court may be able to direct you to the probate clerk, and the probate clerk may be able to tell you where the records are archived or stored. If it's any comfort, probate law has always been complicated. The earliest laws in the United States came from England and Spain. Both the English common law and the Spanish civil law are used in the United States depending on the state. 
Presently, there are nine civil law or community property states. These are the states that derived some of their law concerning marriage and property ownership from Spanish civil law rather than English common law. The law in these nine states are cons uh, laws are considerably different in this area and affect the probate laws also. Arizona, California, Idaho, Louisiana, Nevada, New Mexico, Texas, Washington, and Wisconsin are usually considered to be the community property states or the uh, civil law states. Alaska is sometimes included because they also recognize uh, community property. One of the most important features of our modern probate law is the use and introduction of the Uniform Probate Code. This uh, was first introduced back in the 1970s, actually occurred during the time I was in law school. It was drafted by the National Conference of Commissioners on Uniform State Laws. These state uniform state laws exist in many areas of laws of law in the United States. Um, unfortunately, rather than being uniform, however, they are, have been passed and accepted only in a certain number of states, regardless of the type of uniform law. So the, the term uniform might be a little bit misleading. Those states, uh, of the United States, only 16 states have adopted the Uniform Probate Code. Those are listed here, including Utah and Arizona, uh, uh, Alaska, Colorado, etc. All of the ones that are listed are the Uniform uh, Probate Code states. Now, uh, again, the, the term uniform might be misleading because uh, Arizona, for example, has amended its Uniform Probate Code many times since it was originally introduced, and the law in Arizona is considerably different than the law of another uniform probate code state, such as Utah or uh, uh, Colorado. You'll notice from this list that there are some very significant um, omissions. Uh, none of the eastern New England states, for example, have adopted a uniform probate code. The main reason uh, for adopting the uniform code was to abolish the percentage attorney's fees charged by attorneys against the estate. Uh, historically, the attorneys charged a, a fee of anything from a few percentage points up to half of the estate for, for handling the probate. Uh, in the Uniform Probate Code states, the attorneys are required to submit a bill for their time itemized in a in a bill to the court for approval before any payment can be made. It's important to understand that probate may be necessary either with or without a will. The will is kind of uh, uh, an artifact of, uh, of transferring the property but is not uh, the purpose for having probate. Probate is the uh, orderly transfer of property from one from a deceased person to that deceased person's heirs or assigns. If a probate happens with a will, it's called a testate action or testate probate. If it is without a will, then it is called intestate or without a will. Most states have laws that essentially write a will for everyone. Most of the very simple wills that I saw people have or drafted for people were mirrors or almost identical to the provisions of the state intestate laws. That means that without a will, the property would have passed in exactly the same way or very close to exactly the same way as it did with the will. These are called the laws of intestate succession. Now here's a few definitions that might help. First of all, you have a testator testatrix. That's a person making the will. 
administrator is a person who administers the estate without a will. An executor or an executrix is the person administering an estate where there is a will. And the Uniform Probate Code states though both of those people are called a personal representative. So anyone administering an estate is a personal representative with or without a will. Here are a few definitions. Uh, oral wills are those made shortly before death and communicated to witnesses. It's necessary for the witnesses to have made a written copy of the, of the oral will and that that uh, oral will be witnessed or signed by the witnesses. And it's possible that this, this type of will, an oral will, may or may not be recognized in the state where the person attempts to make it. If the will is considered to be what's called an uncoopative will, it must have two witnesses and in most states can only deal with the disposition of personal property. This type of will can be made at any time, uh, even with or without contemplation of death. Both oral wills and uncoopative wills are sometimes referred to as deathbed wills. Really isn't a category in the law called a deathbed will, but that's uh, the common term that's used to describe that process. Next are holographic wills. Those are wills that are entirely in the handwriting of the testator, the person making the will, and they're enforced depending on the law in the particular state or place where the will is made. Uh, many holographic wills still require a written signature of witnesses, usually at least two witnesses. Another category of wills uh, mentioned uh, frequently is called a, a pour-over will. This type of will is used in, the, in conjunction with a trust of the property where the trust is and the trustee is going to be the owner of all of the property. Uh, in that case, if the trust is being used as a testamentary device, that is a device for transferring property after death, uh, often the person drafting the trust will recommend that in addition to the trust that the people putting their property into the trust sign a pour over will providing that any property that fails to be transferred to the trust during lifetime is transferred upon the death of, the, of those making the trust. It's kind of a backup provision for a trust, making sure that all the property gets into the trust uh, that's necessary. There is a term that is used called a simple will, and it's usually refers to a will that provides for all of the property to go to a surviving spouse and in the absence of a surviving spouse to the children in equal shares. Um, as I mentioned in the slide, this type of property will seldom make a difference as to the way the property is distributed from the laws of intestate succession Usually the main difference is if there are differences in the percentages of property being given to any one of the, the uh, possible heirs. Another type of will is what's called a reciprocal will. And this is a uh, will driven be, uh, that is um, drafted between two individuals uh, leaving everything owned to the other. So this is commonly a surviving spouse where the spouses have mirrored wills or reciprocal wills leaving everything to the other spouse. In more rare cases there is a joint will and that is a one document that is treated as if it were two separate wills providing for the disposition of the property on the occasion of the first person 
to, do, to die, and then uh, the remainder of the property upon the death of the second person. Um, one of the questions that rises in the context of uh, probate and wills is the situation where there have been multiple marriages and where not all of the children are the children of both spouses. So one of the spouses has children who are not uh, the children of the other spouse or both. Um, there are a variety of methods that are used to uh, attempt to resolve this type of problem. Uh, in this case, there is a uh, will type called a mutual will, where the married couple are, or the committed couples are uh, trying to assure that their property passes to one or more of their heirs. And that's usually the children of the relationship. Um, and it's uh, also an attempt to bind the surviving party by the provisions of the will so that they can't be changed in the event of a, uh, of a dispute. Okay, well that covers the, the uh, basic introduction to will types. Stay tuned for part three of this presentation.